the uh, standalone game on Sunday night is Chiefs and the Ravens. Chris Collinsworth will be there with Al Michaels, Michelle Tafoya, kickoff at 820, and the festivities begin at 7 Eastern on Football Night in America. Chris, thanks for joining us. I know that you were uh, at Florida, spent your college days at Florida. Were you recruited by West Coast teams back then? I was. I got recruited by USC and flew out there knowing there was no way I was leaving Florida at 18 years old and flying and going to L.A. But somebody offers you a free trip to Los Angeles. You've never been before. I've never even been on an airplane by the time I got my first recruiting trip to Florida State. And I can remember just sitting there staring out the window like this is the most incredible thing ever. But um, well, here's my recruiting trip. Anthony Munoz took me to a Lakers game. They gave him, they gave him 200 bucks to take me out on the town. He takes me to halftime of the Lakers game, goes, ah, this game's kind of boring. Let's get out of here. I'm like, oh, okay, we're going to go party in LA. All right, let's go do this. Drives me back to the hotel, hands me 20 bucks to get a cheeseburger and says, hey, it's been a great time. Hope you come here. <laughs> Takes the other 180 bucks and pockets this sucker and goes home. But as part of the trip, I got to watch OJ Simpson play tennis. They took me to his house. I got to see the Heisman Trophy. I got to sit out in a little chair and, and I think it was his agent's house while they played tennis. And that was that was a big part of my recruiting trip. We were talking about Urban Meyer, you know, that that you can get a recruiting class in college and it can change, you know, your 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 program. He he can't really do that. At, and uh, and I don't know if you can get used to losing so it doesn't eat away at you as much. But, you know, that whole college experience of going from Ohio State where he lost seven regular season games, he might lose seven by Thanksgiving. What advice would you give Urban to sort of Ex- not accept losing, but somehow tolerate losing for a little while so it doesn't eat him up. You know, it's a really good point that you control the whole process when you're in college football. If you have bad players, it's your own fault, right? You didn't go recruit the best players that are out there. Uh, it's a humbling experience, you know, either one way or the other. I, I, in Florida, my junior year, we switched coaches and we went 0 10 and 1. And I'll never forget that experience as long as I live, just because it was like every time you went into one of these big lecture halls that had four or 500 people in it, or, and you would, and, and inevitably there would be some joke made about the football team. And I never really experienced that. You know, in high school, we were always good. We started off pretty good at Florida and we were, oh, 10 and one. And I always thought that alone I could win one game, you know, just, just one, come on. Surely I can make enough plays to win one game in a season. And it just was so insane to go through that. And for Urban, I don't think he's ever had a losing season in college. Uh, I had him on a show once and I looked, I remember, I think it's 17 years he's never had a losing year. And sitting on the sideline the other day, watching what was supposed to be the worst team in football, kind of eat his bunch alive over there. I, I don't think there's any way to get used to that. I, I don't. And, and I'm sure he was flattered and when some of the USC rumors were starting to kick around out there. But I don't think that's him either. I, I you know, I, I think he'll stay the course. He's going to be fine. He's a good coach. Um, but the other thing is you may not be able to quite work NFL players the way that you could just sort of work Tim Tebow in that crowd. The only guy that I really ever saw get away with that was Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy Johnson, when he first went to Dallas, they said those were among the hardest practices in the history of the National Football League. And of course, when they went one game, I think their first year. And then after that, it was game on. Yeah, I just don't know. You can see every loss on Urban's face. And they're not a lot of losses, but it just feels like you, you, it's going to eat you up. Like, like, you know, Saban, when he went to the Dolphins or Spurrier, when he went to Washington, you know, they were like, I I can't control this. I don't like this. I, I'm going back to college. And I, I don't want to say that Urban pulls the ripcord after one year, but I don't see him coaching the entire contract there because I just don't, I don't think it's in his DNA. Well, you know, the other thing about Urban is he did walk away from it at one point. 
right? And I'm not so sure if it was him or his family or the the pressure. And and, and even in broadcasting, you know, I mean, I, would, I do the stuff with PFF now. And I can remember when I first started doing this, if I had one newspaper article from the San Diego Times or whatever the newspaper is out there, that was like gold, right? I could build a whole broadcast around that one article because it was before the internet. You didn't have the information. Now I couldn't, I couldn't study all of the stuff that is put in front of me if I had a month to get ready for one of these games. So there's this frustrating feeling of you're never finished. You know, you're never ready. You're never quite ready for the game. And for somebody who's won as much as Urban has won, when he loses, he we already know that about his personality. He takes that on himself. He internalizes that. So he's going to feel like he's not doing enough for the Jacksonville Jaguars to win football games. And you just worry about somebody who has never lost. I mean, he has never lost during the course of his career how that will impact him because we did see him walk away once. He's Chris Collinsworth, NBC. Sunday night football will be the Ravens and the Chiefs. I was saying this early, well, on Monday, that I could put together a highlight reel of Lamar Jackson of all the incredible things he did in that first game, but I could also put together a highlight reel of all the negative things, and it's only one game. Like there was a, a like a Brett Farvian type feel to, I, I can keep us in the game and I can keep you in the game. After watching, you know, the highlights or the game footage, uh, what do you take away from what Lamar Jackson is is trying to do or needs to do? Yeah, it's not unfair. And, and in particular, one thing you, you take away from almost all of his tape is that when the game's really on the line, that read option is no longer an option, right? He wants that <laughs> ball in his hands. Like they almost fumbled one because the running back saw the read just like he did and knew that ball was his. He saw that guy just sitting there crashing down inside, but it didn't matter. Lamar was going to take it on his hands. Uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about during the broadcast um, is that, that Lamar, I think when he has more space to work with, uh, is even better. Uh, I think of Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson will drop 11 yards deep in, into the backfield. And when he steps up, that forces the angle of those defensive linemen to be much deeper. So what was happening in the game the other day he would step up. I mean, he would only take a yard or two drop after the shotgun snap, and he would be at about seven yards, maybe six yards. And so those ends of the Raiders were just crashing almost horizontally down on him and also impacting him was the rush up the middle. But if he were to go to a little bit more, which he did in this game some, to about a 10 or 11-yard depth, and the angles of those pass rushing ends becomes much more vertical. Now they're 10 yards deep with him. When he steps up in between that, there's only two defensive tackles in there. There's not two defensive tackles anywhere in the land that are going to slow that kid down when he starts stepping up into that space. So to me, if, if I were coaching him, I would try to create as much space around him, which would meet a much more vertical drop and a deeper drop than what he's doing right now. What about an empty backfield? Why not put somebody else, another lineman or another wide receiver, and just get rid of the running back? They do some of that, and and, and it's a really good point, and it, and it is successful, and it does work. Um, the problem is they're playing 17 games now, and as great as Lamar is, I still think you want him picking spots. Uh, I still think that's why Justin Fields is probably – really well served playing at least some of this season behind Andy Dalton. Andy Dalton was playing Aaron Donald the other night. He knew he had to get that ball out of his hands in two seconds. His average time to release against Aaron Donald was 2.08 seconds. Now to give you some perspective, the fastest in the league last year was Ben Roethlisberger about 2.2. So he was, he knew what he had to get done. But until you watch or play against an Aaron Donald, you don't understand how fast that ball has to come out of your hands. And so, I, and I think in the same way, Lamar 
is a guy that that you want to be able to control the rush and you want to be able to control when you're running the football. You don't want to be just taking off in 17 games a year and running 10, 12 times a, a, a game. You're just not going to hold up. And, and any chance the Ravens have to, to win a Super Bowl, obviously, is built around Lamar. What did you take away from the Rams that you think is going to be sustainable? Oh, man, I... I I really like Matthew Stafford. I, it, it, Dan, I, I went back, and so I didn't – we don't do that many Lions games. We just don't over the course of however many years now. And I said, all right, okay, I, I'm going to get ready for this game, and it was about a month before the game. I'm just going to watch all of Matthew Stafford's throws from last year. I'm, I just – I've got to get a feel. So he's played in three playoff games. He hasn't won any. They trade the world for him. They're going to get him. So let me just watch what he does. He is really good. He is really good. Now just remember, at the end of this year, I, I came on this show very early and said, he's better than I thought. And the, the reason is, A, he's got the big gun. I mean, there's no doubt about it. But he threw some 45-yard seam routes after scrambling, after the play broke down, and through these rocket shots inside of NFL starting three safeties in the middle of the field, and it got there before they did. On his on those digs and those crossing routes that are over the middle, watch him. They didn't throw any the other night, which I was really disappointed in because I wanted to show it on television. But watch him just maneuver with his eyes and he'll he'll get a guy to take one step and then he's so cocky with his arm he'll throw that thing he'll whistle it and I I can't tell you how many throws in a row over the middle I saw that probably missed the linebacker's hands by a foot it's almost like he's teasing him like a bullfighter or something he's like and then Ole you know and he's got him and, and so it, it's really interesting to me when those guys are at the high end of that and we don't see it that often. And we didn't see it that often because the team and in particular, the defenses that he had on those teams simply wasn't very good. Are you in like or in love? I'm in life right now. I, I'm in like, I, you know, I, I still think that you love guys with a proven track record of not just getting to the playoffs, the winning and coming from behind and being able to Patrick Mahomes is, is a unique guy. He has proven now, and he proved it again the other day against Cleveland that he can take a really bad situation and go over to the bench and go, guys, come on. I got this. Don't worry about it. You guys just go out there and run around a little bit and I, I, I'll take care of this. And he does, you know, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, the great ones have a proven track record that they do it not just in the regular season, but in the postseason. And and I, I may love them, but I, I, I but I got to see that. I know that people, we love to overreact. That's why Monday's called Overreaction Monday. But what, mm-hmm. is there a proper, what's the proper reaction to Green Bay's performance against the Saints? Um, it's one of those puking emojis or something. I, I don't know. It, it's a, that, was, that was pretty ugly. Um, and I don't think it would have driven any of us crazy, but for what happened this off season, you know, I mean, that was as unsettled an off season as perhaps the city of green Bay has ever had. Um, and people choosing sides and people, Oh, let them go to Denver. We don't care. Are you crazy? You know, we're, we're love's not ready for this. You know, it just was back and forth and back and forth. And last year, we clearly saw the ticked off Aaron Rodgers. He did not like the fact that they drafted Jordan Love, right? He did not like that. He came into camp and he was mad. And you know, Aaron, he's he's really good when he's mad at the world and, and focused and locked in. Then this year, they sort of went through whatever they went through. Uh, and so even if they get beat on opening day, you go, eh, big deal. You know, okay, it's going to take a little while to get it going. But the fact that they got beat like that and they got beat by a Saints team that we weren't sure was going to be any good and by Jameis Winston, who threw five touchdown passes on 20 throws. On 20 throws, he threw five touchdown passes. Now you start to go, 
did this impact? Okay, I'm 99% sure Aaron Rodgers is going to be fine. He's going to bounce back. He's going to play the way he always says. It's going to be fine. But did this somehow impact this football team in a way that is going to you know, impact them as we go through the season? That's the part I don't think any of us know yet. We we love these lists and, you know, in a pro football focus or NFL Network or ESPN, like, you know, greatest players of all time. It feels like people have a problem saying Tom Brady's greatest football player of all time because he's not a great athlete. Like greatest resume. How do you how do you, you, you kind of uh, define that greatest player of all time? Is it the greatest athlete who is also great at his job? Like Jim Brown or Lawrence Taylor or whoever you want to throw in there, but or is Tom Brady the greatest player of all time? Um, let me ask you this question. Yeah. This is my legal training Ooh. coming back. Ooh, you, you know, you are a lawyer. Well, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I did graduate, so that that counts for something. Okay. Was Babe was Babe Ruth a great athlete? Yes. He was. Yeah. So could Tom Brady be that same kind of great athlete? So in other words, I, I don't think, I, I mean, to me, among the greatest athletes I have ever seen in my lifetime is Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods never gave up the lead in a sport that is built to choke. How many times have you and I played golf and we've been through a thousand situations, we've broadcast Super Bowls, we've, we've been at the free throw line with the game on the line, we've done, we've done all that stuff. And yet there's something about holding a golf club that makes you choke. It, you, you just do it. Anybody would be lying if they said they never choked on the golf course. And this guy for, I don't know how many tournaments in a row when he had the lead, never spit it up. He never gave it up. So to me, great athletes, it's as much about what you do in those moments with everything on the line. And Tom Brady, time after time after time, has just delivered on that. And, and now you can't even say, oh, well, it was the Patriots. It was the great teams. It was Belichick. It was whatever. It was his ability to, to bring that team together. They all talk about the text and the, and the messages that, that he sent before that Super Bowl to where they walked in that stadium and they didn't think they were going to win. They knew they were going to win because they had Tom Brady at the helm. So you would say Brady's greatest football player of all time? Not even close. Great to talk to you as always, Chris. And uh, we'll be watching on Sunday night. Uh, my best to the family. Thank you, bud. All right, man. Good seeing you, Dan. That's Chris Collinsworth, NBC. Sunday night football, Al Michaels and uh, Michelle Tafoya. Interesting uh, USC uh, answer. They're going over to OJ's house to watch him play tennis. Oh, boy. Uh, football Night in America starts at uh, 7 Eastern. Could I have been clumsier in asking the question about Tom Brady, greatest football player of all time? Like, uh, he's a great athlete. And then uh, where, uh, Lawrence Taylor and Jim Brown. And then, uh, God, shut up. Yes, Paul. No, I think you have to do the semantics of the question. Because when you say the greatest football player of all time, is it resume? Is it ability? Is it um, career? Yeah, what? but he, I, I, I should have just said, Who's the greatest football player of all time? Want to call him back? Nah, he's probably still listening. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. I, I, yeah, he, he just gave me a thumbs up. Sorry about that. Took forever. Just spit it out. <laughs> spit it out. Damn.